crowd. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. Um, as foretold in the prophecy, I do have a slide deck uh, this time. Um, so without further ado, uh, is there anything we wish to discuss before um, I launch into this presentation about um, the status of the SES proposals? I only have one thing. I, I, I emailed, I've been emailing Mark about it, uh, underscore underscore proto. But that's a very tiny thing, so we can we can discuss it later. That's fine. Underscore yeah. underscore prop. Proto. Pro, pro, proto. proto. The, dunder, the dunder proto. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which uh, which Karidi, I actually had had not been able to take the time to look at before this meeting. I've I've noted it in the minutes. Uh, that we will revisit that topic when uh, when we're prepared to discuss it. Sound good? Yep. Uh, I'll, I, yeah, I will go so far as to put that on the agenda for to next week's meeting. Sound good? Yep. All right, cool. Um, I'm going to share. Question, are we going to have this meeting next week? It is overlapping days wise with the TC39. On the other hand, uh, in most of our time zones, TC39 is uh, not now. Back no, we, we never have it. We never have it during TC39 week. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think we should continue to not have it during TC39 week. There's enough meeting and discussing these topics during for TC39 itself. I agree. Uh, procedure from CHIP. Um, so we will cancel next week. Cool. All right. In that case, uh, if we have time today, maybe at the end of the meeting, we can talk about Proto because uh, it will be discussed in next week um, um, a plenary. Okay. Well, let's time box it now, actually, if, uh, if there's urgency on it, because this presentation can. Uh, let, let, let's, uh, do you think that you need 10, 20 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes is fine, probably. Okay. Thanks. Uh, um, go ahead. Yeah, so they, they, there have been some conversation for quite some time now, more than a year. Um, uh, this conversation is about moving things out of Annex B. And the, the, I think Marx has been the champion of that for quite some time. And uh, one of the things that popped during those uh, conversations and pull requests was the underscore underscore proto uh, versus um, or things like underscore underscore define uh, getter and define get define get get define set and so on, and um, I'm trying to make the case that underscore underscore proto is actually very important cap capability of the of the language in order to provide full virtualization of a realm, and my assumption here is that. If you don't have underscore underscore proto, that means that you are not going to be able to deny the undeniable intrinsics. Because you don't have a way to tell the engine that when producing an object from syntax, the proto of that object is going to be something else, not the, uh, uh, the default provide uh, undeniable intrinsic. That's my assumption. I'm sorry, the, when you say syntax, I just, there's two different under protos in the spec. Uh, one is um, the accessor property on object prototype. Uh, and the other one is the special syntax and object literals. Uh, which one are you talking about? The, the, the latter one. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, that's, uh, okay, now I understand. Yeah, I've been confused this whole time. I thought you were talking about the other one. Um, uh, the syntax, the, the special literal syntax is in NXB? Question mark? To, 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 to clarify, I'm, I'm talking about the accessor on the object prototype. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Um, okay, that's what I thought you were talking about. Okay, so you're not talking about the syntax? No, no. Okay. So, uh, so, so the accessor um, 
how, why, since the accessor is in any case removable and replaceable, and the ability it provides is also provided by um, uh, object dot get prototype of object set prototype of. Um, I, I, I never did understand why it makes a fundamental difference whether the accessor exists in the initial state. So if if you can now provide your own, and this is my understanding, am I being correct? If you can now provide uh, the underscore underscore proto um, uh, getter, special getter in the object prototype that when, when called, it will try to replace the actual uh, object prototype with something else from a undeniable intrinsics to something else. If you, can, uh, if you don't have that hook, uh, we will not be able to provide a full virtualization of uh, all the undeniable intrinsics. And let, let me, let me, maybe that's the wrong way to, to, to say this. Is there a small piece of code that you can use to illustrate the point? Because I'm, I'm right. So I'm, 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 I, I feel the, lost. In my email, I, I, the, the example that I used was one, uh, if you do in grammar, in syntax, you do a square bracket, square bracket. So you create an, an array. And then in that array, you try to access the, um, you, you try to do, let me see. Whoa. Um, okay, so a simple one would be, if I replace array.prototype, I replace it with my own thing. Okay. The entire, the entire object, I replace the entire object and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and I replace all the pieces of it. In the case of the membrane, we might be able to provide a proxy of the outer array prototype. That's the case. Um, if, if we do so, how can we guarantee that when you do square bracket, square bracket, square bracket to produce an, an object and you do a, a something with that object, uh, you're not going to hit the undeniable intrinsic associated to the, uh, to the newly created array, which in this case is array prototype. This goes back to the conversation that we had a few weeks ago about um, the idea of denied access to any intrinsic from a realm and instead provide a full virtualized set of proxies that provides all the functionality of the language. So if are you, are you try are are you trying to you're trying to deny access to um, the local array prototype? Yes. Uh, and, by all means, by all means, yes. And uh, the assumption is that the code, the local code, is starting from open square bracket, close square bracket. Mm -hmm. And uh, if if they, so open square bracket, close square bracket, um, no matter what you do with Dunder Proto, open square bracket, close square bracket will create an array object that does inherit from the local array prototype that you're trying to deny access to. Uh, and what you're trying to do is prevent a faithful walking of the prototype chain. You want to, to take any attempt to walk the prototype chain and misdirect it to, um, to walk across the membrane in, right. into the other array prototype. And to clarify there, there are two ways in which you can walk the proto chain which is you intentionally use the utilities to access the proto, or you try to do an operation that the engine tries to execute by walking the proto chain. So two, right. two and with the, right, and with the engine walking the prototype chain, clearly it will always walk to the local genuine one that you're trying to deny. Um, but unless, the key thing unless there- that you, Unless that you provide you on underscore underscore proto, right? No. Uh, what what are the, the the situations where the engine is walking the prototype chain? It does not do it by invoking the proto accessor. Uh, you can you can see that because you can remove the prototype accessor completely, 
and all of the inheritance properties that where the engine walks the prototype chain will still work. They all work before we added Dunder, before we added the Dunder prototype accessor to the language, and they'll still work if you remove it. Right. Um, uh, well, I'm on the assumption that the that it works if you remove it and it works before we add it. But if you have it and you customize it, you provide a hook for the engine to. No. Okay. So then, then, uh, then, then this is not a problem. Like this is not going to provide what we thought it was going to provide initially. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's worth experimenting with because you know it's, it's I've been wrong with, about this kind of thing before, but I'm pretty oh, sure that the, that, the, that the engine just goes directly to the internal, um, to the internal uh, walking function and does not consult the accessor property. Okay, let me test that. All right, perfect. All right, thanks a lot. All yep. right. All right, thank you. Um, if somebody could capture the conversation in the minutes, that would be wonderful. Uh, wrong one. Don't know how it missed that. How about this time? Are you seeing a presentation or a calendar? I see the same presentation. You're seeing presentation SES sync. Oh, good. And then Zoom is just behaving very strangely for me. All right. Where okay. did it put my tab? <laughs> there it is. Okay. Um, and now you're not in presentation mode. Okay. Now you're in presentation mode. All right. Cool. All right. So the purpose of this this presentation is for us to sync up on uh, the various. Uh, the statuses of the various proposals and implementations of uh, some CES relevant specifications. Um, we have some eventually to be consistent truths about CES, uh, the specification proposals for TC39, the XS implementation, uh, the CES shim implementation to the extent that it's possible for it to be consistent, um, and the documentation for CES, which currently reflects the old reality, uh, the, pardon, the pre-compartment reality. And then, of course, um, my aspirations as uh, for for all of these, based off of uh, the uh, the the requirements that uh, that I've been fed for uh, making progress with Agoric. Um, and uh, so, just to recap, the, the, the we're 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 planning to reframe. Um, the CES proposal as an umbrella. It is currently, the CES proposal as, as written today is a proposal for realms. Um, and uh, it, with that, our understanding of CES has evolved since then. Um, it's now uh, broken down into some much more constituent proposals that we have yet to write. Um, apart from realm, realm is, realm is in the, <laughs> realm's in the bag. Um, but we need to write a proposal for lockdown and harden. Um, and the proposal that Bradley has started for compartment is still a sketch. Um, and um, we have learned through conversations here and, and abroad uh, that the compartment proposal needs to become layered because it has lots of different facets uh, um, that, that, are, that, are, that are good checkpoints um, toward, toward getting it into the specification in particular. Um, pairing out uh, host virtualization as uh, a, a topic to revisit later, um, as well as uh, um, just layering the, the evaluator and the static module loader and the dynamic module loader. And even the dynamic module loader could conceivably broken, be broken into two layers. Um, so uh, this is uh, a slide that Brian Werner put together for us to uh, sync up with Figma last week. Um, and the, uh, the, the idea of this is that the, the proposals as they stand today reflect a reality where the security boundary that we're talking about is the border guard between realms. Um, and the compartment specification uh, reacting to, uh, reacting to the, uh, the difficulty of protecting integrity at the border guard layer um, 
has moved to an approach where we have a powerful start compartment that is uh, in the same realm as the confined compartments. Uh, so this this implies um, two additional uh, two or two or three additional specifications: one for uh, one for the compartment for the confinement purposes, um, and one for uh, lockdown and how it uh, how it how it changes the the uh, the start compartment, um, among other things. Um, so, so I'm proposing that we have some action items. Uh, we need to update uh, the CES proposal and create these uh, supplementary proposals. Um, and of course, uh, we need to uh, uh, rewrite the the docs directory under the CES shim because it currently reflects realms. Um, uh, and realms do not exist in the CES shim anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, apart from that, then breaking down uh, lockdown and uh, coming up with a story for shimming um, and then evolving the sketch for the compartments API into spec-ish uh, and then breaking up the compartment proposal into layers for evaluation, static modules and a module loader. Um, and, and evidence suggests that if we uh, if we uh, get compartments as a beachhead uh, in the specification, then we can begin to discuss how to thread host virtualization hooks through realms and compartments on a piecemeal basis uh, to make them uh, more difficult to dismiss as a block. Um, so, so the CES lockdown today as implemented by the shim um, works like this. It introduces a global compartment object, which can immediately be used without any integrity guarantees, reflecting this new reality where the compartment proposal is about, um, it, it is about creating a circle around a, 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 a set of modules. Uh, tip, uh, and, and there are two, there are many ways of looking at that. Um, and it can be used regardless of whether it's being used as a security container. Um, and then lockdown, um, uh, lockdown replaces that compartment constructor in the same way that it tames other powerful evaluators in the environment um, to make it into a security container uh, or, or, or suitable, suitable for, for containment in general. Um, and, and then it goes ahead and erases the unallowed intrinsics in the, uh, uh, in the child compartments and hardens the intrinsics in both the start and child compartments. Um, so this leaves open a question that we've been struggling with. We, we know that we have a story about shims. Um, and, and the idea is that we will have, well, we will come up with some, some story that would allow us to have shims participate in the lockdown process. And we've begun, uh, Mark has, has in particular begun to factor lockdown into two layers, a repairs layer, which needs to happen before shims get a chance to modify the intrinsics, um, and, uh, and then a lockdown, which does the hardening and, uh, and visits all of the intrinsics and, of course, uh, uh, replaces the compartment constructor, um, the, uh, among others. Uh, I, th I think that might actually be in the repair phase. In any case, it, between repair and running your vetted shims, there needs to be an opportunity for shims to inform lockdown um, that they are adding new intrinsics or modifying existing intrinsics in a way that it, uh, the, the, those, thing, those things that it is adding to the environment should not be erased. And currently, these, uh, this object, this data structure for the intrinsics is a private API within lockdown uh, and implemented within the shim, but it would need to become public in order for shims to participate, uh, which means growing the specification for lockdown to include uh, the schema for uh, the intrinsics and the allow lists um, for what not for what lockdown should not erase from the start compartment. Um, and this is uh, a proposal that has uh, has not seen a lot of discussion even within Agoric, and we and, and it would be great to hear feedback in this audience uh, in this in this room. Um, and go ahead. Is this a good time to to, to chat about it, or do you want to go? Yeah, ahead? I, I my my thought on this is that this presentation should be a a, a a long sequence of discussion topics, and if it runs over, it's fine. We should just uh, let, let's talk now. Okay. So my, I, I think a uh, couple of notes. We have uh, we didn't have good success in the past 
when trying to push for proposals that are linked to other proposals and depends on other proposals and so on. So the first question would be, is this repair and lockdown functionality something that could be used without a compartment, without a compartment in general? Can we use this with a realm? Can we use this with an iframe? Can we use this with a, a context created via VM uh, module in Node? Mm -hmm. Um, yep. is it, is it going to give us anything? And if, if it does, then it's easier. If it yes. does, and then it becomes a lot harder for us to get this to completion. I um, think that, yeah, the, the, the pitch for this feature is that this is a defense against prototype pollution. Um, and it, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but I think that it is useful to some extent, uh, without introducing a new compartment evaluator. But it's the, the, that extent is is limited. That that is correct. Uh, it's it's um, uh, if you don't if if you don't if there is no compartment constructor, and uh, this repair shim and lockdown mechanism does not introduce a compartment constructor, uh, what it's still done is it has still uh, uh, repaired the intrinsics, uh, so that you don't have. Um, uh, capability, object capability uh, uh, violations among the intrinsics, uh, and it's hardened all the intrinsics, uh, and it's done it after running the vetted, it's done the hardening after running the vetted shims. So <laughs> from a software engineering robustness point of view, uh, uh, that's not a security point of view, you're in a much more robust system for programming, and in particular, uh, uh, you're in a si you're in a situation where uh, if something is um, uh, buggy in a way that that just sort of thrashes and causes a lot of non-local damage by accidentally modifying objects it's not supposed to modify, uh, you're much more likely to catch those bugs because they'll be modifying properties that are frozen. Um, uh, and also, uh, of course, the repairs will have also removed some non-local causality. So it's sort of like the, the transition, you know, sort of an extreme form of the transition from memory unsafety to memory safety. It just makes all causal paths much more local, which supports um, much more robust programming. I think it can be sold on that on those grounds. Okay. Um, so you said that the repair runs before you execute any shim polyfill. Yes. The, the shims are executed after the repair and before the hardening of the intrinsics. Is it then repair something that you could also have as a, a kind of a configuration when you create a new, a, a new environment? Um, I, I'm trying to think about the ideas of providing something that could work well with iframes and realms and so on, but uh, that also has a reflective or a, 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 a way to do it manually if you want to by calling a method on the, a particular global object or something like that uh, without having to it's hard for me to understand or to articulate why repair will have to call before you do anything else. And, and if that's the case, then why, why is not part of the creation of the environment process that you specify that you want to, uh, to be born into that state rather than yeah. be set into that state? Because then it's very difficult to assess what changes before you call repair. That's my yeah. fear. So, so, so one of the one of the motivations here is that uh, in a uh, uh, in the XS or TC fifty three configuration, um, the you're you're not running in a full JavaScript engine. You're running in a in in a CES engine effectively. Uh, so you're already starting out repaired. There's no unrepaired state uh, to start with. So the repairs, but you'd still be running the shim during the build time phase, <clears throat> which is still a, a, a phase with the repairs, 
uh, but it's not until after all of the build time customization runs <clears throat> that you do the, the, the hardening in you know, preparation for cutting a ROM. So, um, so we'd certainly want to support configurations like that where there simply is no pre-repaired JavaScript because there's just no reason to build all of that mechanism that, re that repair would remove if what you're interested in is running in the repaired environment. Uh, so a secondary question there is what happened if I execute something before repair? What, it, what, what could happen? What could go wrong there? Other than me catching in one of those features that you're going to remove. Is that it? Uh, that's, that's pretty much the main danger is that if you run before repair, uh, then you can capture things that repair would remove. The most obvious example of that uh, is the evaluators. You could capture the original eval function. You could capture the original function constructor. Um, uh, you could capture on V8, for example, you could capture the original error constructor that has all sorts of bizarre reflective things for accessing the stack. Um, uh, so a lot of things that are ill-behaved that repair would either remove or replace. Uh, if you run before repair, you can capture them. I think that is the major danger. Yeah, but for some people, that, that might be a feature they might want. Yeah, to yeah. Do that. And we're not, so we're so we're, we're we're not precluding that. I mean, this yeah. this this design is compatible with that. If you're if you if repair is something that you do because you're starting off in an unrepaired environment, then you absolutely there's nothing preventing you from running code before repair and this. The, what, we're, what we would be proposing would leave all of that well-defined about what happens if you do that. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, you, and then you run the lockdown. Mm -hmm. And that's where things get a little bit more interesting for me. Especially you, you talk about having to provide some hints about what needs to be logged down in terms of polyfills and shims and stuff like that. Is, is that a, 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 a requirement? What happened if the, I don't pro so the So the lockdown mechanism, before it hardens the intrinsics, it goes through, we have um, the, the internal API that uh, Chris was referring to, is um, the, our whitelist. Uh, so we have a whitelist of uh, all of the properties uh, of, on the, of the primordials that are supposed to still be there after lockdown. So before lockdown freezes things, it goes through all the primordials and it removes all properties it finds that are not on the whitelist. Uh, if a shim adds properties, then in order for lockdown not to remove the properties that the shim added, the shim has to make it clear that those extra properties are intentional. Um, uh, has to make that clear somehow so that uh, at the point you run lockdown, lockdown can consider those extra properties to now be part of the augmented whitelist. Um, uh, the other element of the, there's, there's, so there's, there's one element of the whitelist is this one, which is what properties exist uh, and also how they're wired together. The, the, the whitelist actually tells you a lot about the topology by which they point at each other. Uh, the, the other uh, whitelist that we have, which is um, right now in a separate file called enablements, is the very small whitelist uh, of, uh, of data properties holding uh, that we're replacing with access to properties in order to work around the override mistake. We're finding there's you know, something on the order of a dozen or two dozen properties that experience is shown. If you fix those to, um, to um, uh, work around the override mistake, you're pretty much done. We've been expanding that on an as needed basis as we encounter problems. And at this point, we're expanding that whitelist at a glacial pace. It's a fix on the repair or on the lockdown? The, it's, it's locked down. Uh, actually, that's a very good question. I think it's actually repair. I think we replace those with accessors during the repair, right. but we don't harden them until lockdown. That's true. So it's actually, it's actually a repair. Okay. So we repair then, and then we lock down 
I'm, I'm still confused, or not confused, but I'm still not clear about what this whitelisting or allow listing is doing. Right. Uh, uh, and, let's, and let's whether or not we, can, we could just ignore that and say we harden the intrinsics that we understand, those intrinsics are um, what the engine the, is. The, pro the problem is that engines historically, um, uh, uh, as well as uh, hosts, have added um, uh, uh, crappy new properties to intrinsics that uh, if we encounter a property that we've never heard of before, uh, we want to make sure to remove it before hardening the intrinsics. Because if we've never heard of it before, we have no basis for thinking that it doesn't destroy everything we're trying to achieve. And in fact, that has saved us several times before. Do you have any example of one of those crappy things that affect uh, or give you extra power there? Um, uh, I have a unfortunate example of one that the that um, I mean the first example that comes to mind is something that we're not able to fix using this mechanism. Um, uh, but the example that comes to mind of this extra property that a host is adding to random objects is under node the domain property. The problem is that it's adding the domain property to instances that are created uh, after um, lockdown. Um, and the value of the domain property that's adding uh, includes security breaking things. Uh, so even though it's not a uh, example of something that this mechanism actually does address, uh, it comes to mind because it's just something that a, a host inadvertently added without realizing the damage it was doing. That, um, uh, and we, we certainly have, I'll, I'll have to dig to find some examples, but we certainly have encountered that on the primordials as well, uh, that um, something that that somebody added something crappy, we removed it and we saved ourselves. Oh, a great example is the uh, error constructor. The V8 error constructor has all of this stuff for for intervening on uh, stack reflection. And oh, 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 yeah, perfect. Uh, one of the things in the error constructor is that. Uh, the behavior of um, uh, is if you call capture stack trace with the object that you're providing for it to add a stack property to um, being a frozen object, the um, V8 will actually add the stack property to it anyway, even though it's frozen, probably because the, the, the mechanism is taking some shortcut uh, through the virtual machine that was, um, uh, you know, that was not carefully audited for preserving the object invariant. So that's just, you know, that's, that's just a, a, a crappy bug that V8 introduced. I filed a bug against it, they haven't fixed it yet. Um, but uh, the whitelist mechanism ensures that if something like that were, were there and we didn't know about it, uh, it would be removed. If we didn't, if we weren't repairing the error constructor, our whitelist would remove capture stack trace from the error constructor anyway. Okay, I, I, I have to digest that, but I, I feel that doing <clears throat> that, this kind of thing where you have this allow list and you have to also provide extra things that you want to preserve is going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. Uh, problem, first, technical problem, te technical problem or political problem? It, it more, <laughs> more, more like a political problem. Uh, also, it's a hassle for developers because the developers don't have a clue what's going on. The engine um, provides certain, certain capabilities. They have code that is going through certain path that mm -hmm. is not doing any anything uh, harmful, but it's just, using some of these features that are provided by browsers and now we're removing them. There has to be some coordination between the hose and the engine. So the list cannot be specified in, the, in 262, it has to be provided by the hose. 
because the host might want to keep some of those features there. No, the, 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 I, I disagree. Uh, the, it should be specified by 262 because we're trying to create something whose, whose, whose invariants are, are, his properties in general are independent of the host. Uh, um, no, I, I, get, I get that that's what you want. I, I, I feel that that's very hard to get it in because of implementers. Okay. And so implementers okay. will claim that there has to be an expansion slot for yeah. them to provide so, extra things. Okay, uh, so I agree that there's a possible political problem here. Uh, and we've certainly divided things up and, 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 and refactored things in order to navigate through political issues. Uh, but uh, generally we've done it after we've actually encountered the political issues. One of the things that I don't want to do is reduce the, the, the quality of the technical proposal in anticipation of political issues that might not be there. No, I, I get that. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I have the same opinion. I, I still don't feel that this is a big feature that we really need to have. Um, if I could just I'm, share I'm to, go ahead. briefly, sorry, Carity, um, uh, just very much to your point um, on Node.js that you end up doing host specific stuff. Yes, we probably haven't got it right in, in Node.js right now, um, but the model does end up, the, the sort of, well, the model that we have in Node.js right now is we have some kind of attenuation followed by some kind of lockdown. Seems like that's likely the model that, that, that kind of sticks, where, where loaders can control the attenuation phase and um, the, the sort of lockdown happens um, with some host integration. Um, but yeah, I, I, I see that there's like an information problem. The, the, like, I guess practically when we discuss this, we always imagine that we want to just hand it over to, to loader users. We don't know what they're going to do. Expecting them to pass back a nice object where they carefully tell us everything they did. Um, I'm just trying to understand the ergonomics of that as well in terms of what we would want to implement. Um, and, um, you know, if it's just an array of like member expressions or is, is it, you know, a more um, sort of fine grained because the concern there is if you're expecting people to, to construct this, then people might just not do it. And then you end up not being able to enable um, freezing at all for loads that have these properties yeah that's uh, that's that's uh thanks a lot guy for for um bringing this up this is definitely an issue yes like it's just yeah. it's just difficult for people that don't know much about what's going on to decide what to do and what to put into that list and how difficult it is to build that list and what is the outcome or what is the benefit of of yes. versus just saying harden everything that you know uh, in terms of, you know, the objects, those are the intrinsics that, you know, you know, the objects and whatever are on those objects, you're going and do the thing. Uh, and is it, is it going so, to be a big problem? So the, the, um, the reason we call these vetted shims is that you're running these before, before hardening. And uh, that means that everything that happens afterwards is completely vulnerable uh, to these shims. So these, the, you should, the, the decision to run a shim before hardening needs to be a purposeful decision where you understand that the shim is not destroying the properties you're trying to achieve by hardening. Um, the, the whitelist-based removal uh, in our implementation right now uh, provides a diagnostic, shows you when it's, when it's removing, I mean, just you know, does a console log of the message when it removes a property that it was not expecting. Um, uh, and the, the um, so configuring a vetted shim might take some existing shim and just add, you know, add on the side this declaration of what properties are supposed to be added. And you can use this diagnostic to figure out what those, pro what, you know, what the candidate properties should be. But if you just blindly list the properties that it adds without thinking about it, uh, then you know. Then you voided the warranty. So I'm on the. So question for you on that, Mark. 
So normally, the way we look at polyfills is we say, well, if, if the polyfill is adding a new feature that is based on existing functionality that is provided by the, the engine, let, let me find a good example for that. I, I think, uh, like, uh, think about object.assign or, or some other mm -hmm. polyfill, um, yep. which is using all or, or, or some other or a feature that use uh, uh, define properties and get on properties and so on to build the properties that you want. Um, yeah. if, if the underlying pieces are already hardened and they are already um, uh, uh, well defined and they have all the, all the capabilities that you want, it doesn't give you extra power or anything. Anything that you build after repair seems to be fine from the perspective of, well, you're not going to access any of these evaluators and any of these sort of things that might give you extra power. You're just building more features on top of the features that you already have. Um, I, I wonder what kind of things can you do that really damage the, the program in a okay. significant way uh, versus just hardening so, everything that is on those prototypes. Okay, so, I, 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 so the the shared intrinsics, uh, now I'm going to bring in compartments. The, the, you know, the part of the purpose of all of this, in fact, the motivating purpose of all this is to set things up so that you actually have a good security preserving system of shared intrinsics among mutually suspicious compartments. Uh, in order to do that, the shared intrinsics are supposed to be uh, completely without mutable state or IO abilities. The vetted shims are running in the start compartment where the start compartment has um, uh, host powers. It has the original date.now. It has um, you know, all sorts of other, you know, all the original host objects that one expects in the start compartment remain in the start compartment after repair. We're not trying to do my power to the start compartment. But what that means is that a shim could easily uh, add into the primordials, not just mutable state that creates a communications channel or a capability leak between otherwise isolated compartments, but it can actually add in IO abilities. And we're at, so we're allowing that to happen, uh, but we're allowing that to happen only if there is, in addition to the existing shim code, a some kind of declaration to, to make it clear that, there, that this is being done on purpose. I think that that actually, sorry, if I might just add, um, just back to my previous point, that really clarifies the model for me in terms of what Node.js might implement, because um, I guess if we interleave, uh, for you know, this the single frozen intrinsics concept with with the repair and the lockdown running the attenuation in between. And then in policy, allow the global definitions to be defined as a sort of out of band, and then you can have autom automatic generation of that. So it's not something that's that's pushed out to the sort of loaded uh, authors or or people who are writing those insinuations in the first place. It could potentially just be a final end step to to set up that policy that 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 sort of sets that whitelist. Um, yeah. That that sounds like it does get through any of the usability issues that I would imagine, um, at least for Node. Yeah, I think that it's important to note that this API's intended audience is people who are, uh, who are trying to prepare, a very, very narrow list of people, people who are using, the people using this API are using it either because they are preparing an environment that has security properties for their application, or they're participating in it because they are providing shims that uh, uh, to other people who are creating secure environments. Um, and so security is foremost on their mind in both cases. Uh, the, the, the exceptions are the people who are trying to make an existing application work with existing shims who would have to, to carefully vet those shims, thus the name. Um, and in that process of reviewing them, make express decisions about what should be permitted in, in the application's locked down environment. Um, and one example of that would be, um, suppose that you're using a, a color shim that adds a red or a, a red method to the string prototype. 
Oh, you, you have two options here. It, 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 assuming this is deep in your transitive dependencies and it would take forever to get all of your transitive dependencies to agree to removing that behavior from, uh, from, from their packages. Uh, an alternative is, is if you deem that those methods are indeed harmless, um, you could go into your application's process of preparing its environment and introduce uh, a layer that says, hey, all of these methods will be permitted to exist after lockdown and I will run this, uh, run this exact version of that package um, before running any of the application code. Yeah, I'm just having a hard time seeing the difference between the two things that you mentioned. One is you figure that you need that method for whatever reason, so you go and enable it. Uh, the other one is, well, it's enabled, but it tells you that it's seeing something weird that if you don't want it, you go and run the code to remove it. You remove it because you don't want it. Uh, and so I, I, I feel that uh, the outcome of it is the same. Um, it's just how a developer will uh, confront this situation and, and, and move on. And it feels to me that if you really, really care about it, you will, you will look at the logs and say, oh, this thing is, is a thing that the lockdown process doesn't know about it, is complaining about it, saying that it's there, it's being locked down, but it's there. So is it a thing that I want to remove because I feel that this is incorrect? Um, I think it's so, such a tiny piece that flipping the switch and saying we, we had and everything. And then if, if we tell you when we encounter something weird and then you can audit that if you want, and maybe the lockdown can have an option that you can be more specific about it and you can provide an option to um, remove anything that is not there, but by default it does the work uh, of hardening everything, that kind of thing we could explore, like the ergonomics of it. Um, but I, I, th I think that so so having various options, I think, is you know more configuration options is something we can certainly expand to, as we need to. Uh, however, I, I feel very strongly that any time you've got configuration options that affect security, uh, the default should be the safer case. You should never default to the more dangerous case and require an option to be safer. Yeah, we have some prior art on that, like the. We discussed in the past uh, the attached shadow that requires the mode of operation. It doesn't have a default value. It ha you, you must provide it. Uh, we could do that. We can explore the default behavior. And those are the things that we can, we can get into it, uh, uh, later on. But I, I, I feel if we go and present this in, we're going to remove everything. And uh, uh, you, you have to provide the list and so on. It's just going, we're going to get some Okay, Push so here's back. so as you as you were saying as you were saying that it, it, another default occurred to me that's actually even safer than what we're talking about, um, which is um, uh, before running the vetted shims, um, you know during the initial repair phase we first run through the uh, pristine whitelist, the unaugmented whitelist, and remove everything that's not on the whitelist before we run the repairs. Uh, then we run the repairs. And if the repairs had added or changed anything without a separate, separate declaration that it intended to do it on purpose, uh, then lockdown fails rather than removing things. Uh, it actually says, look, the vetted shims did something that they did not declare they were doing on purpose. Therefore, we have to assume that the, that the shim was not properly vetted and therefore we fail to lock down. We actually fail to, to construct a working environment. We do not proceed assuming safety. But still, people will have to provide the, the options. Right. But, this is, but this, right, but this is better than the previous one because it means that um, uh, if they don't provide, in the previous, the previous thing we were suggesting, if the shim adds something that it doesn't declare, we just go ahead and remove it and proceed assuming safety, whereas this default is safer because it means that if the shim adds something that it doesn't, that it doesn't declare, uh, that we actually just halt rather than proceeding from that point, assuming things are safe. Yeah, we can explore that. I think they, 
the, 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 the side effects of moving these to repair is that you might want to just, just repair without a lockdown. And then the, those things doesn't really mean anything. That's true. If you never lock down, none of, none of this means anything. And that's actually a perfectly reasonable thing to do, which means you basically you're just using the repair phase to change your environment. And then everything is, um, uh, is you know, then, then all of your code becomes to be in the post repair pre lockdown execution mode, in which case the fact that, that things do not have good security properties is consistent with the fact that you never lock down, so nothing ever claimed to be providing these security properties. All right. Well, um, I think that we've uh, reached a, a, a useful and novel insight about the design of this API. Thank you, Carity. Um, I'll, uh, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll do a round on that as well, and, the, and maybe come up with a new proposal. Um, we got, you know, a few slides in. Um, <laughs> um, if uh, if every slide is is this, day, <laughs> I think that it is. I think that we have our docket for the year worked out, um, which, which is actually great. Uh, <laughs> because I stress out about what I'm going to ask you guys to talk about to, uh, at these meetings every week. So um, problem solved. Um, um, uh, uh, Chris, maybe it makes sense, given, given that kind of expansion, to have uh, maybe next time we meet, uh, do one where you go all the way from beginning to end without the discussion, just yeah. so we get a sense of the whole thing, and then we go back to the beginning and do it with discussion. Yeah, sounds great. It sounds great. Um, yeah, so that'll be the plan. Next week, we'll do a cursory review of all of the topics that we have. Uh, on the on the docket and then uh, and then go through them again and probably break it up into a whole bunch of conversations um, but not yeah. but not next week but ne next time we meet yes next time um, yeah we're a little bit over I'm going to turn off recording <laughs>